Welcome to the final week of Spooky Month! This week, we're going to be taking a look at one of the few games I've kept since I was a child. I was a stupid child, I would trade in games a lot. But what I didn't trade in was Tim Burton's The Nightmare Before Christmas, The Pumpkin King, for the Game Boy Advance. It came out around the same time as Oogie's Revenge, which was for Xbox and PS2. But I didn't have any of those at the time. I only had a Game Boy Advance, so I got this game. Is it as good as I remember with my nostalgia? Probably not, but let's take a look at it anyway. The game begins by saying that this is a prequel to the Nightmare Before Christmas movie. Jack plans to prove why he is the Pumpkin King this Halloween when Oogie is told by Lock, Shock, and Barrel about him. Oogie decides that he wants to meet Jack and Boogie's boys, as they're called in the movie, accidentally kidnap Sally instead of Jack. Oogie then arbitrarily gives up trying to kidnap Jack and decides to just attack Halloween Town with his army of bugs! Wait, what? Yeah, in the movie, he was revealed to be a burlap sack filled with bugs, but he suddenly has a huge army of the things? Why does he use machinery to try to kill Jack at the end of the movie if he has this army of bugs whenever he wants? Also, why did Sally need to be kidnapped? Jack begins his quest to save Halloween Town and is only told about her when the mayor and the doctor tells him about her. I'm fine with damsel in distress stories, but this one just seems tacked on and unnecessary. Maybe they were trying to say how Oogie and Jack might have known Sally in the movie, but Oogie would have tried to kill her in the movie too because she tried to save Santa, and it's Jack's job to know everyone in Halloween Town, and we had a good feel of how their relationship grew in the movie. They could have used her character as something simple, like getting an upgrade to the Pumpkin King suit. As a fan of the movie, this element just seems unnecessary. The visual style, though, is really good, especially for the Game Boy Advance. This is pretty much what I would expect for the pixelated version of the Tim Burton art style. Like here, we see one of the main images in Halloween Town, the fountain pouring green water. Which you'll never see again because the hub area is elsewhere on the map and this is just a dead end. And here we see Spiral Hill, something so iconic it's used on the cover of almost every release of the movie. Or we would if the camera would just pan down a little. In terms of audio, I love the sound effects, but the music has some problems. See, the music is taken directly from Danny Elfman's score, and while it's still good music, it wasn't designed for video games. It was designed for movies. See, movie music and video game music are very different things. In a movie, you usually listen to a song once, maybe twice if you include a reprise. Video game music, however, loops. As a result, you have to hear the same melodies over and over. Some composers, like Koji Kondo, spend time playing the loop over and over again to find out if they'd get tired of it. That's why the Super Mario Bros. theme is so good. He did that for it. However, I don't think the designers had that in mind for this game. I would play the music for you to show you what I mean in the background, but like in the Back to the Multiverse episode, I won't do it so I can avoid copyright crap. I'm pretty sure if Fox would do that stuff at the drop of a hat, Disney would do the exact same. The controls for the game feel off. See, Jack doesn't turn around immediately when you want him to. He slides, then turns around. It's great for style, not so much when you're trying to maneuver around the game. The game itself is a Metroidvania style. You explore around the levels trying to help everyone in Halloween Town. However, the game is very linear in that regard, and I'm not talking in terms of story. I mean the level designs have very little exploration to them, which kind of goes against the Metroidvania ideology. If you search some areas, you might find cool rewards, but you don't get a lot of little changes. You just get decent upgrades at the time the game tells you to have them. Of course, that doesn't stop the game from letting you go the wrong way through an entire level. I discovered a hard mode for one of the levels where I went through it backwards by jumping up here. But the upgrades you find in the game are as follows. Shrunken heads that give you five more hit points, and that's it. Weapons, the upgrades to them, and the power-ups are just given to you as part of the story. Although you can find the possessions of the Halloween Town citizens, or Halloweenies, collecting them only gives you concept art. 
Now, this may be just me, but, but concept, concept art, art is not, not a, a good, good reward. reward. How about unnecessary but cool weapons if you find them? Oh, would that have filled up the weapon select ring too much? Fine, how about we remove some of the shrunken heads you find, and instead, you can give the mayor or somebody else's items, and in return, you're given a shrunken head. Eventually, you'll get Zero to follow you around. His nose will glow when there's an item nearby, so if it glows and you can't get to it, you'd better remember because the map does not show you if a room has an uncollected item. There are also flying sections with Zero, each of which has a shrunken head, and each of which involves you just avoiding obstacles. No attacking bugs that may have found their way into the chute, just dodging. As for the platforming itself, there is only one real significant problem. You can't see what's below you. And often there are damaging areas there that take off health if you touch them, or even enemies right below you that you can't see. If the camera was panned down, or if the camera would look down while you were ducking, that would be great! But it's like one designer positioned the screen, thinking that Jack would only be moving up or horizontally without being told that the Metroidvania-style games include down as a possibility. Bosses and enemies are varied with different effects and such, but how is this snake a bug? Why are these cow snake skeletons so hard to beat? Did that bug just flash me? Oh yep, he flashed me! Bad touch! Bad touch! Get him out of here! I don't want him! Also... Why are there no scorpions? I've heard the argument that they're not Halloween-y, but since when are moths and grasshoppers and gnats considered Halloween-y? The scorpion would have been a really cool and obvious choice as a dangerous bug. Oh, and the last boss fight isn't that great. It takes way too long to beat. And it just uses Oogie's regular talking music instead of the good boss music. I know I said I wasn't going to show you, but let's take a look at these clips. Here's boss music for the other bosses. Here is Oogie's last boss battle. Here is his talking music. And here is the final boss. They just screwed up. The last thing of any note is the mini-games. You unlock three mini-games, but they're not that good. They're just Mario Party games with a Nightmare Before Christmas aesthetic. Crush skeletons, hit bats and rats with different mallets, and find the ball under the mixed cups. Wow. They were just filling up space on the cartridge at that point. Oh, for the love of crap, it's hot in this thing! <sighs> All right. The game, is it fun for Nightmare Before Christmas fans? Yes. But as a game critic, I can't say that it's that good. I have to give it a D plus. Thing is, if you're looking for a good Metroidvania game, I would have to recommend something like, you know, Metroid or Castlevania, where the name came from. Yeah, you'd only really like this game if you're a fan of Nightmare Before Christmas. That's probably why you can get it so cheap. All right, thus ends Spooky Month, and I'll see you all next week.